that just makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's just bullshit. Fuck. Oh, my. my. I, I have a question. This is how I will get excited about Mars. Okay. Can you Go make a it. sex tape on Mars? I think so. It's 40% of the gravity. Okay. Oh. Just think you'd be not floating. So there'd that? be like this whole, like, less than half. <laughs> You did not, in my view, address just fundamental questions. 680,000 years of snow ice layers, which require a win winter summer cycle. Let's say you have 2,000 kinds instead of seven. That makes the problem even more extraordinary. Multiplying 11 by what's uh, by three and a half, we, <laughs> we get to 35, 40 species every day that we don't see, they're not extant. In fact, you probably know we're losing species due to mostly human activity and, uh, and the loss of habitat. Uh, then as far as NOAA being an extraordinary shipwright, I'm very skeptical. The shipwrights, my ancestors, the Nye family in New England, took, spent their whole life learning to make ships. I mean, it's very reasonable perhaps to you that NOAA had superpowers and was able to build this extraordinary craft with seven family members. But to me, it's just uh, not reasonable. For us, in the scientific community, I remind you that when we find an idea that's not tenable, that doesn't work, that doesn't fly, doesn't hold water, whatever idiom you'd like to embrace, we throw it away. We're delighted. That's why I say if you can find a fossil that has swum between the layers, bring it on. You would change the world. If you could show that somehow the microwave background radiation is not a result of the Big Bang. Come on, write your paper, tear it up. So your view that we're supposed to take your word for this book written centuries ago, translated into American English, is somehow more important than what I can see with my own eyes is an extraordinary claim. And for those watching online especially, I want to remind you that we need scientists, and especially engineers, for the future. Engineers use science to solve problems and make things. We need these people so that the United States can continue to innovate and continue to be a world leader. We need innovation, and that needs science education. Thank you. All right. Thank you both. Answers in Genesis may have crossed a big line. Their, uh, their job application requires you to testify to your Christian faith. And which, by the way, isn't the whole Noah's Ark thing, isn't that all Old Testament? I'm not a big Bible guy, but... The, I'm told. But isn't that before uh, Jesus got the gig? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I, I mean... Right? I'm just, so the, I'm just the science thing. correspondent. I don't d d discuss biblical matters, but yeah, go and then ahead. The other thing, I think you're right. Yeah, the other thing, uh, you can't be homosexual. You can't be gay. That's on their job applications. And apparently you can do that if you're the Hobby Lobby or whatever. But you can't do that if you're going to take tax dollars. So one of their big things is that they bring in tourists to the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and therefore they feel that they are entitled to certain tax breaks. And so they may have crossed the line. They're not backing down from that. You probably know your sign. Or do you? Try this. Wait for your birthday, then stay up all night. And watch where the sun rises. It will pass in front of one of the 12 constellations of the zodiac. They say, I'm a Sagittarius. So on my birthday, you might expect the sun to rise in the constellation Sagittarius. And it did. 2,000 years ago, when the Babylonians made all this up. But it doesn't now. In the last 2,000 years, the Earth has wobbled like a top. So now on my birthday, the sun rises in Scorpio, not Sagittarius. So maybe you'd have to be a Capricorn to be a Sagittarius, and Scorpios would have to be Libras. See, astrologers are off one full sign. In 2,000 more years, they'll be off two signs. But they don't seem to care. So, in these reflective moments, I ask myself, am I a fun-loving Sagittarius or a sexy Scorpio? Back in my day, when I was young, <laughs> you go to the library uh -huh. <coughs> and look things up. And you'd look things up in 
the World Book, which is an excellent source, by the way, and Encyclopedia Britannica and these things. And the information in those books was, in general, very good, very accurate. So the skill we need now, uh, Joseph, is not just to look things up. That's the good old days. No, in the better new days, you have to have the skill to sort through it. But I guarantee you that by having in your case, millions of sources of information, you will get better, more accurate answers to almost any question than anything I could have done in my time. So the skill that we need now is sorting through it. You have to develop that as a critical thinker, as a scientific person. You have to develop the skill to sift through that. Whereas in my day, we had to develop the skill to just find it in the first place. So that's changed. I just said what I thought. Uh, that if you're a grown-up and you want to go off and believe this, uh, inconsistent with nature idea of creationism, that's okay, but don't make your kids do it because we need taxpayers and voters. And so I say to creationists of all ages, what is it? What is it that you find so compelling? What is it that makes you so into this? And all I can think, everybody, is we or I, as a science educator, have failed. Uh, that if you look at the evidence in nature, it's, it's stunning. It's overwhelming. It's wonderful. <laughs> Rubidium becomes strontium. And it does so with its extraordinary half-life. Almost 50 billion years. You can do it for decades. They observe these minerals. They do them cold. They do them hot. They do them in a vacuum. I don't know if they do them underwater, but they probably do, and the rate doesn't change. And so when you find rubidium becoming strontium and you have this half-life, you can work backwards and figure out how old the Earth's got to be. Why you would run around and want the Earth to be 10,000 years old and try to reconcile that is just amazing. <laughs> it's really amazing. And you got to appreciate, I feel, that we have to appreciate that people have already embraced that. We're we're not, probably not going to change their minds. We got to work, this is, I, I say all the time, we got to work on the young people. Now, well, the potential is great, I mean, and we've tried it with some success, but there's been mixed reviews. Uh, and I don't know if you guys, you guys are into genetically, so I called the chapter, What the GMF? <laughs> <laughs> genetically Modified Food, which yeah. is a word, you, I mean, an acronym that you don't hear too much. Genetically Modified Organisms, Genetically Engineered Organisms. As you may know, they've got they, the genetic modifiers were able to make corn and soybeans that are resistant to this extraordinary pesticide. Roundup is the big brand. Kills freaking everything, but not the corn and soybean plants that have been modified. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it was also, if you don't know the story, we're killing milkweed. And you know how if you're a monarch butterfly, milkweed is, I mean, milkweed pollen is the best. <laughs> it's the best. And so by accidentally killing the milkweed, everybody was deeply concerned that we were killing off the monarch butterflies. And apparently we were, but not to the extent of a panic. It was uh, uh, not that big an effect. I mean, a concern, but not that big an effect. But just what if it had been, right? What if it had been a huge thing? And so I just remind us all, we have enough food in the world uh, to feed everybody. We just can't distribute it. And we've also got this just weird problem in the United States where we have malnourished fat people. And so, I mean, it's a mistake. It's just we kind of, it's just not managing things properly. And so, uh, and this has economic costs and so on. What I want everybody as voters and taxpayers to consider is the ecosystem. We can know with extraordinary precision what happens to any organism, any plant, anything you modify, but you can't know exactly what's going to happen to the ecosystem. You can do pretty well, but nobody saw the pollen blowing from the canola into the other guy's field. Did it really, or did he steal it? And you know, can you patent genes and so on? And so there's just a lot of, um, there's controversy because of these gray areas. And, and I just, inca I ca just for the sake of the e ecosystem, I want to go slowly on that, Absolutely. especially when it comes to using tax dollars to fund that research. And the, um, the golden rice would put vitamin A in rice, seemed like a cool idea, but it hasn't changed the world, revolutionized life in Africa the way 
people once thought it might. But the real, if you want to invest in there, is clean water. If we had a way to get clean water. Yeah. Nuclear power, I'm concerned about you guys. 433 commercial reactors. There's a lot of military reactors. 433 commercial reactors. Three of them, Three Mile Island almost blew up. Not quite, almost. Chernobyl blew up. Fukushima is not working very well. And I do a job for Toshiba every year, Toshiba, and um, everybody in that company knows somebody or knows somebody who knows somebody. Mm -hmm. Can't move back there for 300 years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, would you get in a car that has catastrophic failure three out of 433 times? No. But what about all the people that die from uh, oh, okay, carbon and I got coal, you. I'm hip. And... I'm down. <laughs> That's not good either. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, so, but see, we kill people in other ways. <laughs> uh, great. <laughs> no, so, I mean, I'm a mechanical engineer. I, like so many of you, I just can't wait for my mechanical engineer magazine every month. <laughs> and my colleagues just love nuclear power. I think it's the greatest thing. And I'm open-minded. You dig the stuff up, you fish in it, you put it back in the ground. It sounds like a great thing, but it's just too complicated for humans. It's Homer Simpson running the thing. That's what's wrong. <laughs> I mean, if it, if it, they just have something to prove to me. That's all. Let's talk about the, the facts. You're saying that. No, no, no. Let true. me finish my question, Bill. I want you to take a look at this polling. Um, only about 36% of Americans think global warming is a serious threat to our way of life. Now, again, let me let me pause it. Everything that Van and the White House have said is true. However, the scare tactics have not worked. And don't you need public consensus to move the needle on this? So how do you want to get public consensus? By saying that it's not happening, that it's not serious, that shorelines aren't flooding, that we're no, not... No, I want you to advise the, advise the oh, politicians. Oh, advise the politicians. Because they're not... Whatever they're doing, whatever Van is doing to scare the public, is not changing Inform public Inform the public, but go right ahead. Let's just start with, we don't agree on the facts, right? So this, this third report came out saying it's very serious. You say no. Right? That's, there's the essence of the problem, Essie. Well, the science, it, the, the researchers say yes, you... Not all the researchers. And again, hope. even the IPCC says that there's no uh, frequency or intensity when it comes to hur hurricanes. Okay, hurricane, so, schmurricane, if I may. This one the says about tornadoes. Hit. It's the same thing. Yeah, sea level is rising, hit. although it's, it's retracted. It's um, increasing at a slower rate over the past few years. We've had Arctic okay. ice globally increasing. Data. I think no, not No, not absolutely. Why did this one come out? And, 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 like, and I start this like so many trains of thought with me. This starts with sex. <laughs> um, that the best idea anybody has as to why anybody has sex, whether you're uh, a sea jelly, a dandelion, um, a jacaranda tree, the, the reason you have sex is to get a new combination of genes, a radically new combination of genes that the germ, your enemy is not lions and tigers and bears. They can be trouble, first to admit. <laughs> oh my. But your enemy is germs and parasites. That's what's going to get you. And Ebola would be a classic example. So by having a new combination of genes, living things apparently are able to stay just slightly ahead of the mutating germs and, germs and parasites. So if you clone yourself, you're going to not be doing the mix. You're going to be following one behind. If you do that a few times, you're going to be falling behind her and behind her and behind her. And then you're going to show up at the emergency room and the rest of us have to pay for your uh, rehydration and uh, resuscitation machine because you got some germs that the rest of us already dealt with. But do you, do you think people really want to clone themselves, or is it more just the technology could be used to produce organs in a peachy dress? Well, that's a whole nother. Yes. Ha, 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 Mr. Sherman. <laughs> Dr. Sherman. <laughs> no, I'm a huge fan. The trouble is, historically and quite reasonably, they use the same word, cloning, for uh, 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 replacing stem cells in an, in an mm -hmm. egg. I mean, to me, what would be better, getting a titanium hip, like some people have? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, yeah. from a lot of bicycling, uh, or um, stem cells having your own joints, stem yeah. cells grow you a new hip. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thing is that they're done the same way. You, you, at least mechanically, you poke this crazy thin pipette into the ovum and the, that DNA out and 
uh, put the other DNA in. And it's called fusion, fusing. And so, you, you know, there's a time when um, the uh, a fertilized egg is, is 160 stem cells or so before they've differentiated. And so if you could find a way to induce those to uh, make you a new hip, it would be just cool. Mm -hmm. What people are doing is introducing the idea that scientific uncertainty, in this case about cold weather events in what we call back east, uh, are, is the same as uncertainty about the whole idea of climate change. And this is uh, unscientific, it's not, it's not logical, it is, it is uh, a way, apparently, uh, that the fossil fuel indus industry has dealt with uh, our politics. And this is not, this is not good. Everybody, uh, you don't, this is not, uh, you don't need a PhD in climate science to understand what's going on. That things, that we have overwhelming evidence that climate is changing, that you cannot tie any one event to that is not the same as doubt about the whole thing. So what I would encourage everybody to do is back up and let's agree on the facts. Would you say that the Antarctic has less ice than it used to? We, when you said you asserted, Congresswoman, that a change from 320 to 400 parts per million is insignificant, my goodness, that's, that's 30 percent. I mean, that's an enormous change, and it's changing the world, and that's just over the last few decades. You go back to uh, 1750 with the invention of the steam engine. I mean, everybody's been over this a lot, but it's gone from 250 to 400. There is no, there is no debate in the scientific community. But I just want you to know why it's important, or why it's important to me. It wouldn't matter if we had some extraordinary people who live outside of the mainstream and uh, consider this a religious business that they're in, and they really are out to save people and spend their intellect and treasure doing that. But understand that really at the, in the back, or the basis, or the thing that they work very hard at, at Answers in Genesis is indoctrinating young people, indoctrinating science students. These look like science tests, right? You get the Tyrannosaurus, the Stegosaurus, here's electricity, a clumped particle, a changed particle, the potential in uh, circuits with multiple paths. For This looks like science, right? There's an AND gate, an AND gate, so on. But in the back of all that, and the Earth is 6,000 years old, which is uh, not true. We have a saying in science, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Things like psychic projections, visitors from outer space, physical objects passing through people's bodies, or things that just seem to defy the laws of science. See, scientists try to understand the world. That's what we do. When we see or hear about something wild or unusual, we check it out with science. So I am now going to make a wild, way out, extraordinary claim. The world is round. See, it looks like a table or a board. Now, once in a while, you might see mountains or hills, but those are just like little bumps on what looks like a flat earth. Well, here's what happened. People noticed that the place that we seem to be living would every now and then cast a shadow on the moon. And when it did, that shadow was always round. Now, the only shape we know of that always casts a round shadow is a ball. It's our curvature of the Earth horizon model of science. And this blue stuff is like the ocean. And this boat, well, it's like, like a boat. Anyway, watch <clears throat> as ships sail away. They don't disappear all at once. Now, first, the bottom will disappear. See, the bottom of the ship is gone. Now we can see midway up, and then the whole thing disappears. Now, ships came back. They didn't fall off a table. So people realized that the world is curved. I mean, it's a big curve, but it's curved. So the process of testing claims, the world is flat, the world is round, is what we call science. Now, if you have a claim that can't be tested, that's what we call pseudoscience. The difference between pseudoscience and regular science is whether or not you can test it. The flat earth, well, that didn't stand up to tests. The round earth did. 
Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. The world is round. I'm out of here. Uh, consciousness has kind of baffled us for a while, okay? And evidence that we haven't a clue about what consciousness is, is drawn from the, in, from the fact of how many books are published on the topic, right? We're not really continuing to publish books, not really, on like Newtonian physics. It's done, all right? So, so the fact that people keep publishing books on consciousness is the evidence we don't know anything about it, because if we knew all about it, you wouldn't have to keep publishing. <laughs> so, so what I wonder, what I wonder, Richard, is whether there really is no such thing as consciousness at all, and that there's some other understanding of the functioning of the human brain that renders that question obsolete. To that, I've got to say, like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And am, I, am I like thinking, or am I just like thinking that I'm thinking? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Will you Richard, stop? Oh, gosh, wait, sorry. Richard. <laughs> we went, we went decades, we went decades not understanding the procession of Mercury. It was this big mystery, and we invented solutions to it, like a mysterious planet Vulcan tugging on it such that the, its, per, its perihelion processed. And, and that wasn't the explanation at all. It was uh, obviously general relativity, another thing, not the original question <laughs> we were asking. So you say you want to know what consciousness is. Maybe that's not even the right question. How about oh. this? What's the nature of consciousness? Excellent. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> um. And you can absolutely show the Earth is not six or ten thousand years old. That is, that's just wrong. So uh, I'm not going after anybody's religion, but you, we can't use tax dollars intended for science education to uh, teach this idea that the Earth is ten thousand years old as an alternative to the observable facts. I mean, that's, that's inappropriate. That's what started this whole thing. If you want to say it's God, I, I, it is unknowable. As we say, you can't test, you can't prove a negative and so on. That is to say, I can't prove it's not, for example. And, but the Earth is not 10,000 years old. Ancient dinosaurs did walk this planet uh, up to 65 million years ago. I am a science nerd and I encourage people to wear bow ties. They don't they don't slip into your soup, they don't flop into your flask, but for me, as a critical thinker, or a guy who tries to think critically, a guy who works to think scientifically, to, to argue that there's some words translated, I believe, if I understand it, from Aramaic, that, are, that serve as a science text, that's just not satisfactory to me. If you want to claim that God started life and then three and a half billion years uh, went by and here we are, well, I, that's very difficult to disprove. Uh, on the other hand, if you say that the Earth is only 10,000 years old, that's very straightforward to disprove. That's been strongly disproven. And on CSI, there is no distinction made between historical science and observational science. These are constructs unique to Mr. Ham. We don't normally have these anywhere in the world except here. Natural laws that applied in the past apply now. That's why they're natural laws. That's why we embrace them. That's how we made all these discoveries that enabled all this remarkable technology. So CSI is a fictional show, but it's based absolutely on real people doing real work. When you go to a crime scene and find evidence, you have clues about the past. And you trust those clues, and you embrace them, and you move forward to convict somebody. Now, I just want to remind us all, there are billions of people in the world who are deeply religious, who get enriched, who have a wonderful sense of community from their religion. They worship together, they eat together, they live in their communities and enjoy other company. Billions of people, but these same people do not embrace the extraordinary view that the earth is somehow only 6,000 years old. That is unique. And here's my concern. What keeps the United States ahead, what makes the United States a world leader 
is our technology, our new ideas, our innovations. If we continue to eschew science, eschew the process, and try to divide uh, science into observational science and historic science, we are not going to move forward. We will not embrace natural laws. We will not make discoveries. We will not uh, invent and innovate and stay ahead. So if you ask me if Ken Ham's uh, creation model is viable, I say no. It is absolutely not viable. So when you say this to a creationist, the tree is 6,800 years old, they go, I don't know. Why should I, I see it now? <laughs> and, and, you know, I shouldn't do that accent because stu no. stupid people are everywhere. Well, he and his people have done is used the word science in this new way. It's very much like the people who deny that smoking causes cancer and that right. there's climate change. And this is to say you take what would be scientific uncertainty, plus or minus such and such percent, and turn it into doubt about the whole thing. A couple of times in the debate, you know, somebody asked a question in the audience when they opened it up, and you said, that's a great question, like, how to, where, where did consciousness come from? Do, 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 uh, do, what do, happened do, before the Big Bang? Do, 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 and you said, what you said was, we don't know. That's the crux of it. When they hear that, that's when they shit in their pants. <laughs> The idea that we don't know. It scares some I people. Know, and every time you said it, Ken Ham would say, uh, well, you know, Bill, there's a book. <laughs> I got this book. As I say, Mr. Ham and, and the grown-ups, uh, they can do what they want. But my concern is for the students, for the kids in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the environs there that are brought up with this. And then they're taught uh, that, oh, yes, people are going to oppose you. As you grow up in life, people are going to think that your views are wrong and uh, unsupportable. And, of course, you are wrong and unsupportable. But uh, You could say that out loud, Bill. But it's, uh, well, part, yeah. part of the thing that really in that situation, Bill, that was really, I think, difficult for me and what I worked really hard on was not slapping my forehead right. and not freaking out. And, and that's good because I agree that we do have to engage people. Yeah. Do you think that... Uh, the other things other than the black holes, like strangelets or, or you know, magnetic monopoles or any of these other things like vacuum transitions and all this, you know, are they going to be problems and why do you think that is not being talked about more? I don't think they're going to be problems. They're going to be part of this new physics that we don't even know about. I mean, my grandfather did not know about relativity. How many people have been in a car with global positioning? You, in order to use global positioning, you have to take into account not only uh, special relativity, the relative motion, the speed of the spacecraft, you have to take into account the, grav the general relativity, the gravity of the Earth. That wasn't even understood a century ago. It wasn't a million years ago. It's just two generations ago. I mean, what's going to be understood about magnetism and what's nowadays called string theory or dark matter or dark energy? It's going to change the world. I don't think it's anything to be worried about. It's something to be exciting, excited about and embrace so that the quality of everyone's life will be that much richer through, dare I say it, science! Edwin Hubble was sitting at Mount Wilson, which is up from Pasadena, California. And Edwin Hubble sat there at his, this very big telescope night after night studying the heavens. And he found that the stars are moving apart. The stars are moving apart. And he wasn't sure why, but it was, it was clear that the stars are moving farther and farther apart all the time. So another astronomer, Fred Hoyle, just remarked, uh, well, it was like there was a big bang. Uh, there was an explosion. This is to say, since everything's moving apart, it's very reasonable that at one time they were all together. And there's a place from whence, or rather whence, these things uh, expanded. And it was a remarkable insight. They went out uh, listening. And there was this hiss, this tss, all the time that wouldn't go away. They turned it this way. The hiss was still there. They heard it that way. It's still there. Astronomers running the numbers, doing math, predicted that in the cosmos would be left over this echo, this, this energy from the Big Bang that would be detectable. And they detected it. We built the cosmic observatory for background emissions, the COBE spacecraft, and it matched exactly, exactly the astronomers' predictions. 
You got to respect that. Very reasonable that the recent trouble in Paris is a result of climate change. This water shortage in Syria. There is a water shortage in Syria. This is fact based. Um, small and medium farmers have abandoned their farms because there's not enough water, not enough rainfall. And especially the young people who have not grown up there, have not had their whole lives invested in living off the land. Young people have gone to the big cities looking for work. There's not enough work for everybody. So the disaffected youths, as we say, the young people who don't believe in the system, believe the system's failed, don't believe in the economy, get are, are more easily and 